an incredibly long time to make back what we put out to do this project. What we've been doing is doing volunteering in the, in the community and doing other type of community work in order to bring our treatments to the community. So she, uh, we, we work with St. Anthony's and we're trying to, she, she works with a, a veterans group and does free volunteering to bring acupuncture to the lower income community. But we, in our own space, as far as we will have a bath that is affordable, but the treatments, because we're having to pay professional licensed masseuse, it's, it's, it's difficult for us to get treatments down to maybe something that anybody could afford if they were on a very low income scale. But we do plan on giving um, uh, discounts to people that live in the neighborhood, and then we do plan on having a few hours that's, um, that's like a dollar a minute. So there's some other of the, like the Thai places that have a dollar a minute, and that would be something that it seems like they're very busy and people can... The price is still... But we can expensive, only that but we can limit the time. Do, do, do you accept that type of insurance? Um, we're not going to do that in the beginning. We'll look into that later because as an acupuncturist, I can um, accept that. But it's just a lot. We have a lot going on. Yeah. It's difficult <laughs> to deal with working comp and insurance in, this, in that circumstance, besides an acupuncture. Yes. Just in terms of the affordability, it might be interesting to consider like a, a buy one get one model. So for people who are with a lot of disposable income that are coming, um, if they want to like donate to a fund that can be used to support uh, that is really around here, or like partnering with some of the local companies, especially those that have community benefit agreements, to do some sort of partnership that's where they true. support like yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. kids or youth or seniors or disabled folks um, to like help those partnerships grow. That's cool. um, so here's a copy of the name of the newspaper. Thank um, you. Welcome to the tenor one. Um, okay, uh, move on to the next presenter, um, Randy. Uh, tenor one is in. Did I still need to pass out? Yeah, I think we need that. I think we have brought us with the folder. Del Seymour and Pam Coates are, are already on board, and as demand needs, other residents will lead people to show them the great architecture of the neighborhood, uh, which again, people don't appreciate because a lot of people never come into the Tenderloin. We're also going to do event space at night. We'll have three nights a week where there'll be people coming into the neighborhood for events that hopefully will be popular. Uh, one of the 
things that I notice whenever I'm down here at night is how desolate the Tenderloin is at night. There's like literally nobody on the street. It's not that there's like people dealing drugs and people are afraid. There's literally nobody on the street. Nothing is open. And you know, now we have piano fight, we have uh, counter pulse, and we're hoping that we will also be another thing at night so there'll be a little more foot traffic. That we, we don't really have any foot traffic at night in this neighborhood. It's really unfortunate. Uh, and we're hoping that that, and of course the, the spa or the other place will be in foot traffic thing, but, uh, you know, so we're, that's where we are. We're hoping to open by late May. You see the construction going on. Uh, talk about dealing with the city. It's amazing how difficult it is to do business in San Francisco, quite frankly. Even we're considered a very pro-business, we have a pro-business mayor, pro-development, but when you actually try to do business and do development, you know, and what, Playing the park put us through on the museum and just staggering amount of time. I wouldn't even wonder. But if you had any questions or anything, yes. Uh, I was just thinking as you were talking, there used to be a Greek community here. Right, right over here at Betty Street, right? Yeah. Now, uh, is there any outreach to the to you know? Have you contacted any people in the Greek community asking them? about, you know, say, what it was like then, and... Well, G Kathy Looper was part of that Greek community, and she's Greek, and, oh. uh, you know, the, the Greek community's kind of gone from the Tenderloin. Uh, uh -huh. The one ethnic community that is still here, and that has been a large financial supporter of the museum, is the Indian community. Uh -huh. you know? And one of the things that people aren't maybe aware of is that, you know, have the Indian community not been interested in the SRO business, I'm not sure the Tenderloin would be a, a low-income neighborhood today. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've been very well. So many of the owners, who, well, they don't live here in the city anymore, but they grew up here. We are one of the most diverse neighborhoods. I used to say that we were the most diverse neighborhood in the United States. Apparently, Queens has uh, exceeded us in New York City. But we still are an extraordinary diverse Now, I will tell all of you, if you don't know this, prior to 1960, we were 98% white. We were an all-white neighborhood. In fact, it was rare to see an African-American in Tenderloin. They were told they had to stay on the other side of Van Ness. That's fact. Yeah, so we were a very white neighborhood until 1960. <coughs> San Francisco was very white. People think we had Chinatown and we had Hunters Point, but it was a, and some of, from Western Edition. We were really a white city. Well, well, uh, I assume that it, uh, during World War II they changed because they came here for the for, for the work. It's well, of course, yeah. World War II was a lot of. It didn't change the. I'm talking about the residents of the Tenderloin. No, it didn't really change. Uh, it was whites. I mean, remember, first year the armed forces were segregated. Uh, World War II had a dramatic impact on the Tenderloin because it launched our gay bars. And, you know, we were the start of the gay and lesbian movement in San Francisco and transgender. It all started in Tenderloin, you know, not the Castro. That's where it moved once we launched it. Yeah. Randy, can you give a little bit of the layout of the museum? Because there's so much history in the Yeah, well, you know, the Gujarati history, the Vietnamese well, actually, history. You're right, because the what I brought you doesn't show the interior of the thing. Basically, you know, there will be people, and some of you may be among them, who will go to the museum and say, I can't believe they left out this. <laughs> you really have to make choices. And uh, so obviously not everything is in. Uh, but we try to tell the story of the Tenderloin really in terms of what I think the story is. It's really an area where there's been social movements of people who resisted the establishments and efforts to homogenize the neighborhood and transform it. And it is quite remarkable how we have resisted the efforts. You know, people, when I got to the Tenderloin in, in 1980, I can tell you, everybody thought we were just gonna be an extension of Union Square or downtown. If you said, you know, in 2015, maybe we were at no one believe it. I mean, I was at a meeting uh, at the Dahl Hotel in, uh, the, 19, the late 1980s, might have been early 90s, and it was an issue with the former owners of that hotel, which was a for-profit developer who was brought in to do the original UDAC deal in 84, four hotels involved. Anyway, at that meeting, the developer said, 
Lincoln, in front of Dahl, we were planning on tearing this down and, and building a high rise. And I said, you can't tear it down. We have, a, you, you can't, we have laws against it, and we have an eight-story height limit on this site. And he said, by 1999, those laws will be changed. Well, he was wrong. But, you know, so we, you know, the Tenderloin is a remarkable community nationally of all the activists here who, who fought to protect and preserve the neighborhood. And that's what the museum is trying to do, sort of say, hey, people have, a lot of people have a negative image of the Tenderloin, but they need to know the history and they might feel better about it when they finish. Yeah. Can I make good use of that basement in there? Or are you just going to have it all? Well, actually, we plan, we plan to use the basement as part of the museum, and unfortunately, uh, <laughs> Extraordinarily rising construction costs, which is also a problem TNDC is having here. Any of you, anyone doing construction anywhere, construction costs from the time, from like May 2013 to a year later, went up 40%. <laughs> and we didn't have the money to do the basement after that. It's really, it's, it's really expensive to build anything. Well, that's so a it's a giant basement you got down there. Well, the basement, though, it's not, it's the same size as the museum, but also the ceilings are only like barely seven feet. So it was not like a really, we got to spend a lot of money making a desirable space. So anyway, the basement's not part of the museum. Yeah. How are you funding? I mean, how, how, is it a fee to get into the museum? There'll be a fee. The, we, 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 we are, we, the, the basic fee will be $10 and then, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, ten dollars and then five dollars for a tour, or eight dollars for a tour. But if you do both, it's fifteen. We're trying to get people to do these tours. Tour in the neighborhood. Yes, that Del Seymour, who everybody knows, and Pam Coates, who already are doing tours, they'll be doing this. And and if there's demand beyond those two, we'll have more. And if Del was, but he's, he'll do it all day. You know, Del. Uh, but if people, you know, we can always potentially use more people who want to do it, and they get, they get paid. Uh, so, we're looking for some kind of membership to the museum with discount for Tenderloin residents, something, we're figuring that out. Like most um, um, museums, they have multiple collections. Are you limited to whatever you have right now, but can you expand your collection and so that we could be replaced six or, months yeah, they change yeah. things? There's things we could replace, that is correct. So, so you're not going to stick, like you said, a story. That story can evolve as you get more collection. Well, I think we would, you know, like, for just to give you one example, like, there, there's a real labor history in Kendall which is widely not known. And we do have a lot on the California Labor School. And, uh, we have more unions than any other community in San Francisco. And, but we could have a whole exhibit on that. So we could bring in, we could do that. Uh, and we're also thinking of doing, like, in the evening, it would pop up art stuff. So in the evening, you'd come, and we'd have a, art, a whole art collection there for, the, for, the, for just for the night. You know, taking that at the end. So doing pop-ups, that kind of thing. Yes? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that uh, another person that does tours is Peter Field. Of the well, he does his thing, right. Yeah. We're trying to think about that. We don't want to yeah. compete with him. We're talking no, about no, Tenderloin residents. Uh, the reason I brought him up is that he doesn't include Bodecker Park in his tour, but he talked to me and said he has, has knows the whole history of oh, that yes. spot. And I'd like to do an event sometime this year uh, with him, just giving the, the history of that corner. Well, that the, corner is in our museum. Yeah. Well, you know, that corner was originally the Arcadia Dance Pavilion. Yeah. And then it was the Fisher Skating Rink. And then it was a dance hall and bowling alley. Then it was the downtown bowl. Uh, there's no spot in the Tenderloin that has a richer history of transformation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because, and I will say, if you look at the pictures, which will, this is all being the museum, Yeah. that was one of the most amazing buildings and most amazing sites in the entire city. And then as time went on, the building kept getting worse. And if you look at the downtown bowl that was torn down, right, to make Bodica Park, you look at that and say, who cares if it's torn down? You should have seen what it originally looked like. Yeah, it's in a, a book on Art Deco in San Francisco. The, the well, it'll, be our, it'll be in our museum. Yeah. Also, that's uh, that site. There's there are a few locations. The Tenderloin one is remarkably. You know, there, everything is sort of here from 1910, about 1907. But that particular site is one of the more turned over sites. Uh, 
Lower Turk has had some changes. We have a then and now section which talks about where sites looked then and now, but that is the classic one. Oh, good, great. Well, we'll have yeah. history of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, the TNDC parking lot you were talking about mm -hmm. was one of the great gambling sites, Bones Remmer Hall, mm -hmm. Bones's Club. And, and uh, you, yeah, we were the gambling capital of the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'll know that. That's why our economy did well during the Depression. Is it also true that the uh, slot machines were founded in San Francisco? They were you know, I have, I, have heard, heard, I have heard that said, and I believe it's true. It was not in the tender line. There's a marker down on Market Street. Yeah. Market and uh, I've heard the slot machine was invented. It's a small little marker where it, it gives the memorial of being yeah. invented. In but it was not in the tender line. No, we had a big... Uh, the museum will have a pinball machine because pinball machine is a big gambling. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but they were big gambling. You'd, you'd be rigged pinball machines to be gambling. I mean, the museum really covers the gambling history continually because that was our history. And our economy was doing great until we elected this mayor who decided that there shouldn't be gambling anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you miss out the jazz part. There's Right well, yeah, with the Black Hawk Jazz Club, and, and, and which of course is a huge thing, and the Wally High Derby. There's an amazing history here that most people don't know, and they're going to learn, and hopefully they'll go through it and say, oh my goodness, I can't believe it's anyone had all this greatness. And also, you bring up also the movie houses, too. What would be, um, 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 you know, we have well, you know, we, we actually, there's, there's a section that we don't have as much on that we had to take out, and we limited it to the floor, the film exchanges. Uh, which were everywhere where, you know, it used to be that the Tenderloin was, the, if you needed it. Where did Market Street get its movies from? They got them from the Tenderloin film exchanges. Because to get a movie, you had to, how did you physically acquire a movie if you were in a movie theater? There's two ways. You either have it shipped by train where there are many fires because the, they were very uh, inflammatory, yeah, flammable. Or you go to, that's why Hyde Street, St. Anthony's was a big film exchange. Uh, and you'd say, I want this movie, and you had to come to bring it back by 11 o'clock at night and it was done to pick up the next next day, like a video store. And that's why you see all on Hyde Street, the first, the 100 block of Hyde, where my office is, you know, those were all movie things. And Hyde Street had a lot of movies, stuff. Golden Gate, they were all movies. That's what, because it was near Market Street. Uh, but the film exchanges, you know, that, they kind of, by 1930, they were kind of done. But we're going to have a, Charlie Chaplin movies came from the Tender. They're all, so, yeah. We have a rich history, as you guys know. Yes. My favorite, Dashiell Hammett. Yes, he's here. Away. He up, the, the, all is great. That's another thing people don't know. Dashiell Hammett started writing at 620 Eddy Street. And then when he was living on Post, there's a, there's a plaque at 890 Post. Post used to be part of the Tenderloin. Mm -hmm. uh, when we did the, 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 when we created a historic district, the reason Post is not in the Uptown Tenor Historic District was that it was put in the Lower Knob Hill District. Post was always part of the Tenderloin, historically. Sutter was never, Polk was never. But Post, and if you walk down Post today, you'll notice a similarity to Tenderloin. A lot of SROs, not very much commercial, it's mostly a residential street, where Sutter is very different. Polk is very different. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so Dashiell Hammett, again, Tenderloin guy, and he there's an exhibit on him. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the back. Oh, this is fantastic uh, information and uh, uh, great effort. Uh, so when I came here in, in the 80s, um, I, uh, I was a director of an art gallery in, um, in Union Square, and I happened to know that to get people to get go into your art observation space, you know, you got to have a way to get them in there, and I was just wondering what you're going to do to get people from Union Square, basically, <laughs> to get them to come well, in and look at your art. You know, that's, your, that's, uh, really, that, that's, a, that's a really great point you, you make, and, and you know, that you, you're very right. And a lot of people think that you can't get people to come into this neighborhood. I think you can. I just want to and we're going to find out. <laughs> uh, my theory has always been that, you know, people said the tech people never come to Tenoa, and I say, well, what would they come for? We don't have any high-class restaurants for dinner. They come outside of Little Saigon. So now we have Piano Fight. Now we're going to have, we're going to have uh, Counter Pulse. But 
what would they come for? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, especially if you're a tourist, you have a lot of attractions. What do we have to offer? And we do have.